right. Uh, so next we're going to invite up Griffin Weber and Sean Murphy, um, who don't need any further introduction than that. And they're going to talk a little bit about the uh, digital twin concept. Who's first, Griffin or Sean? Uh, Griffin. Griffin, perfect. Take it away. Hello again. Um, Sean and I are going to be giving a very brief introduction to the digital twin concept. We're doing expanded versions of both of our talks tomorrow with demos and a lot more detail. So this is just because we know there are people that are only going to be here today just to kind of give you a sample of what this is about. But hopefully we'll be here tomorrow for a deeper discussion of this. <laughs> so as I mentioned before, I have some quick disclosures and then... We mentioned earlier the raw diagnosis codes in our electronic health record systems um, have lots of biases and data quality problems. They often have low precision for the detecting a patient's true condition or phenotype. We mentioned a few times uh, half the patients who have a code for type 2 diabetes don't actually have that disease. As a result, you can overestimate the number of patients who have the disease, and this becomes a big problem in clinical trials. If you think you have a certain number of patients in your hospital that have the condition, and then you try to recruit them and you're not able to actually find those true number of patients because you're overestimating their counts from the, from the EHR data. So we have what's called algorithms that can come up with computed phenotypes for the patients. Algorithms mean different things to different people. One set of computational phenotype algorithms are what's called role-based phenotypes. So here you get a group of clinical experts together to come up with a set of rules, inclusion, exclusion criteria that define um, the patients with that condition. Um, websites like CKB and an Emerge Network have done a lot of work on building libraries of these uh, rule-based phenotypes. They are difficult and expensive to build. There are sort of dozens of these um, computational phenotypes that are rule-based, but not for every disease. Um, so they're slow, expensive to develop, and it's also hard to implement in I2B2. These are complex workflows. You have to recode every one of these things into the software. What we're going to be talking about is a different approach that's using AI and machine learning algorithms to automatically um, predict which patients have the condition from the data. We call these probabilistic phenotypes. They are things like logistic regression models, which come up with a score, which is the likelihood the patient has a condition. And then you can set a threshold on what level of confidence you want to call this patient, a patient with the phenotype or not with the phenotype. These algorithms, the ones we're going to be using are unsupervised, which means they can scale very broadly. You can create a phenotype algorithm for every disease in your electronic health record. So a thousand different diseases can just be done in a few hours as opposed to the manual rule-based ones, which are which don't have that same scalability. One, there are a lot of different algorithms that led up to what we have today in I2B2. One of them really wasn't anything about I2B2, but a lot of people use it today. It's called fee codes. This was a mapping that was developed to roll up the raw IC9 and 10 codes that are used for billing purposes into different disease categories. So this helps simplifying the data a little bit, but it doesn't do the data cleanup for you. Uh, the insider, our collaborator, Tang Shi Kai, a biostatistician here at Harvard, um, discovered that you can get much better accuracy in your data if you look at not only the number of times a patient has the condition listed in their chart as the fee code, but normalizing this based on the healthcare utilization. So if a patient has three visits, which was about type 2 diabetes, and they've only had a total of four visits at your hospital, they're probably coming to your hospital for type 2 diabetes care. But if the patient has a 100 visits at your hospital, and only three of them ever mentioned diabetes, it's much less likely that that's a true phenotype that they have. So when you normalize by the healthcare um, utilization and graph that on a picture, you see a picture that looks like this with two bumps. There's one spike of patients who are coded for the condition but don't really have it. And the ones who truly have it are coming back multiple times to your institution to receive care. So you could fit a um, Gaussian curves to these um, distributions, set a threshold on there, and be able to determine through a purely unsupervised clustering method 
which are the patients that most likely have the condition. It's called Phenorm, and there's been a number of uh, improvements to this algorithm, which I'll go into tomorrow. The algorithm runs in ITB2 in two steps. The first step is based on a, um, a subsequent algorithm called Kesser. What this does is it uses a method called embedding regression to look at how many times um, uh, features co-occurred within a ele patient's electronic health record. So here I'm running the uh, Kesser algorithm on type 2 diabetes at institution, Beth Isbalehi, and this is showing me a, a couple hundred concepts that seem to be related to type 2 diabetes because they co-occur in their chart. Kessler algorithm doesn't assign weights to these, so it's not building a model. It's just giving me a list of features out of the million different concepts that are in our uh, medical ontology that we should consider when building a model. The second step is an algorithm called COMAP, which then takes those features and the data about the patients and assigns those weights. So here in my type 2 diabetes phenotype model, Type 2 diabetes gets a high positive uh, coefficient to it. Utilization is discounts off of it. And then other features that seem to be predictive of the disease get positive coefficients and others that may be other conditions that have similar characteristics as diabetes patients get negative weights. So you plug in all your data into the model. It comes up with that curve and a threshold. And all the patients above that probability you count as having type 2 diabetes and record that as a derived fact in the electronic health record. This is all done automatically. Once you install I2B2, you run this computational phenotype pipeline. It will generate a thousand logistic regression equations for you, one for every fee code in your data set. So you're not having to pull together a team of people to create a diabetes model or an asthma model. It generates a model for all of them. You run your, all the patient data through it, and it takes the entire set of ICA-9 and 10 codes, plus all the other information in the database, and creates a new set of probabilistic fee codes that say these are the conditions your patients most likely have. You don't have to use one or another. We actually can load all of them into I2B2. So if you look in the ontology in our new phenotyping um, branch, there's just the fee codes, the raw data that's rolled up, the unvalidated or not yet validated um, unsupervised fee codes where I'm running a thousand algorithms to find out what diseases the patients have. And then in the end, you can do, if you have the resources for it, to do some manual chart review to confirm that the phenotypes are indeed accurate. And in general, you can't do this for a thousand conditions, but you can take some high priority ones for your investigators just to confirm the accuracy of the models. There's also something called a base cohort. You need a certain amount of data to have confidence in, in the phenotypes are real for your patients. So for example, if the patient just had one visit to the emergency room for a sprained ankle and never came back, that may not be enough information. There's some simple methods, like I just want to find patients who have at least three visits. Um, we'll hear more about tomorrow a method called loyalty cohorts, which is a more sophisticated way of figuring out if these patients have sufficient data at your institution. Uh, the data is available. It exists for SQL Server and Oracle versions of I2B2. It's available in the 1.8.1 release. And again, I'll go into a lot more details about how this works and how you can run an institution and some of the um, you know, issues that you're going to have to deal with as you're trying to run these models. And I will, with that, switch over to John. All right, let's see, Griffin. All right, did I do that right, Mark? So we're gonna start focusing more and more on where the I2B2 trajectory is going and why we think this is the right way to go. Um, everything kind of evolves and uh, we're really looking to put this digital twin chip into every machine running I2B2, uh, kind of from a, from a philosophical point of view. Uh, what's the problem? So the problem is that um, there's a lot of different kinds of data to be absorbed into the digital twin. And at MGB alone, 
we have genomic data, we have lots of different kinds of specialized data sets and blood and tissue and research banks and so forth. Many of these need to be integrated into an interoperable digital twin model for every patient. And achieving that is really quite a uh, difficult task. Just getting the EHR data right into a model like I2B2 or OMOP can be a pretty difficult task. And when we try to do uh, all this other stuff with tumor biomarkers and uh, multiomics data, analytic data, like Griffin was just talking about, um, you know, a lot of the um, free text data that we uh, have seen in this uh, meeting carries so much weight for the patients. Um, pathology data and clinical study data, it's difficult. And many things have to be harmonized um, in doing that. So we can get to that enclave workspace that uh, Sham was talking about, right? And um, let's see what we can do with a new version, perhaps, of how to think about I2B2 and its absorption of data into a full-featured uh, digital twin. So the first thing that we needed to tackle is probably getting just tables of data right into I2B2. It's um, often that data will start as a comma separated value table with thousands of columns sometimes and uh, many rows representing different participants in a study or patients in a database. And the first problem is that um, you need to get it into uh, an ontology. And so we can see here that there's a uh, necessity to get it extracted from whatever we start with into an ontology. And second, we need to actually transform the data into the I2B2 uh, star schema so that we can get both the uh, visualization in the query tool of all the different items that are present in the data, and we can choose them and uh, drag them into the query. And second, we can actually get the data itself into the I2B2 uh, fact table. And Jeff Klan, who just spoke a minute ago about uh, the uh, ENACT uh, data quality project, has been working this through and creating these amazing prompts. This is an ETL prompt, and you'll see in some ways, it almost uh, describes what uh, the I2B2 manuals say. I mean, it looks really a lot like the documentation that we have in I2B2, but it's not. It's a prompt. It's telling a large language model kind of what the data is supposed to look like. And the amazing thing is that when you apply this to a uh, data dictionary and you say, look, I need the ontology to look like this. And many of you are familiar with that upper uh, right-hand corner where we express our ontology. And it starts with what you see down there in the lower uh, left. It can actually do it simply by following that prompt. And then when it comes to the data, you often have millions and millions of data elements. And so actually doing a transform directly with a large language model might not be very efficient. But in that case, you ask it to write a program using the ontology and the transform so that it can use that ontology to populate the concept uh, column in I2B2. And that program can actually then be run on that table to create the I2B2 fact table associated with those patients or participants of the study. And this is the kind of effort, right, that would take months, years sometimes. But with this new technology, we've been looking at creating a finished product in days. Very complex, but in days. This will open up new possibilities for I2B2 to be used in many situations which are just too hard 
right now to get the data into I2B24. Many different kinds of expressions of clinical studies that have been done, um, many different kinds of data sets, like the Gregor set, actually, which was part of that demo, which uh, Jeff has been working on, um, which we can now get into um, uh, something like Emerge. And so we can actually create I2B2s that can hold the data for many different kinds of projects, as many of you have done, but now we can actually do it much um, more. Um, and I say we can do it, but this is a uh, future work, by the way, I need to emphasize this. This is a, the direction that we're going. We haven't gotten there yet by any means. We're just thankful to have some really smart folks like Jeff, and you'll see many people we refer to in this presentation who are working on these problems. But this is what we see we're capable of doing with some of the large language model technology. It does take a bit of orchestration, as you can see here. So here's a, uh, a, a professor of medicine, Lee Tzu, uh, who has been working through how to take reports. And a lot of our cancer data comes in the form of the pathology report. It's report. It starts out as structured data, really nice. But then by the time it gets into the research repositories that we have access to, it's, it's part of a structured report. So then it's a question of devolving that, applying large language models, and making it into the standard kind of um, structured data that we can put into I2B2. Following the pathways of large language models, we're looking to reinvent some of the ways that we do a query. So Mike Mendez, in particular, We'll be presenting tomorrow, actually, how we can how we've been able to actually make some headway into getting the large language model to just accept speech. I want to do this or that, right? And then come in and actually write the query and perform it. All in I2B2, all as part of you could see the back end working in the query tool. But the large language model interprets in that case what the intention of the query is. Part of the difficulty using I2B2 has been making sure that we use the right uh, choices in our vocabularies of all that really complicated medical data that exists, right? What do you call all that medical data? Well, I2B2 does a great job putting it down on the left side, but it's millions of elements. And we're just thankful to have Michelle Morris uh, to do this right now for us. But the fact is that if we now have all these large language models creating new ontologies, how are we going to pick all the stuff out of them? And the way to do it is use the large language model itself to hone in on the data elements that we want. And Victor Castro has been working this through. Then once we get the data into I2B2, how do we get it into those forms that we can use in our new data enclave, ephemeral enclaves that was explained? explored with uh, where uh, Sean uh, talked about this. And the way to get nice tables, again, we use a large language model to direct what does the table, should the table look like and make it part of the I2B2 process to export the table so that we can just end up saying, look, we're going to get a table and we want that exported. Mitch Wadanasen, I don't see here today, is uh, working on this uh, problem. He'll be here tomorrow. Taking this to the end, we can actually even write programs once it gets uh, with large language models to be directed to use that data in an analysis, like a survival analysis, also as part of the large language model output. Now, we've talked a lot about improving the quality using computed phenotypes, which is the high performance, and Griffin didn't really address this aspect of it, but the fact is that using those computational phenotype methods that he described can address millions and millions of uh, patients in just uh, hours of computation. Now, a less... Um, high-performant, at least for right now, method, but one that actually um, is necessary once you get down to a few number of patients is that 
uh, we can get the gray from some of the computed phenotype work. And so we'll get it down from 10 million, as you saw from the very first slide, down to maybe uh, 5,000. But then if we want to do a query like this, where we need to determine if they're eligible for a cardiovascular disease uh, clinical trial, there's not just the gray, which is kind of something that might be, but there's all the red, right? The things that are really kind of difficult to discern. And so trying to extract that from the notes is a place to go to get that extra mile, that last bit of high quality information out of the electronic medical record. And to do that, you can construct a very high quality prompt and say, we want patients to be exactly like this. Can you get that out of, and you need a new kind of vector database, that we're, a new kind of database that we're gonna talk about, or actually we can use uh, Postgres as our database, as we often do, but just add a vector capability to it. PG vector is their um, plugin that they have to create uh, sentence embeddings for all of the documents in the um, medical record that we can then put in and query for their meaning using large language models and these new kinds of databases, which do a surprisingly amazing job. So here was a study done, uh, recently published. You can find this in uh, Sachs AI Journal. I think it was one week ago. And you'll see that the uh, name, we, the, 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 we, we named it Rectifier, was the name of the uh, uh, large language model clinical trial uh, extractor, so to speak, for, for discerning patients who are eligible for cardiovascular disease study. And in many cases, the large language model approach actually got a, gave a better positive predictive value for some of the symptoms, not all of them, but some of them, than the actual human who looked at the same notes uh, was able to derive. Um, in the same way, some of the sensitivity, the recall was um, better when the large language model, the red, the red bars was uh, extracting some of these uh, symptoms and uh, diagnoses. So there's a lot of promise for using large language models in our, uh, our honed down sets of patients that we get from I2B2 to go that last mile so that we don't have to do chart review, right, by hand, or at least we can be largely assisted in doing chart review. And that will be very critical to make the absolute best use of I2B2 for finding and conducting uh, clinical trials and clinical studies. Now, one of the problems that I'm sure all of you are thinking about is, well, but that's all very nice, but you know, things aren't as simple as what I just described. There's long, long trees of orchestration that have to happen and things go wrong when we have really complicated processes, kind of like the ones Griffin described. So, and I2B2 is supposed to be this kind of, you know, application that, that works, right? And if we have thousands of processes and they all have to have their own kind of fine tuning and so forth, how's that gonna happen? Um, and we've been looking at this, things like tracking uh, deterioration with AI and things like doing this kind of chart review hand in hand with uh, a medical record like, uh, and I couldn't show Epic because it's against their license. So I had to pick something off the internet, but uh, for many of you, this would be Epic on the right, and then uh, an I2B2 LLM on the left. And we're looking to do this with what we call agent orchestration. And I guess this is something that we're really going to talk a lot about, or I will talk a lot about tomorrow, in terms of how are we going to orchestrate. And you'll see that using large language models, we aren't limited to what you see on the top, which is I want to do some kind of process automation. And so I run a rule-based data flow. That's what we do every day today. And um, the problem is it's very rigid, right? And it doesn't adapt well to new tasks. If we do it as an 
large language model agent, it actually is able to adapt if there's something that goes wrong in the workflow and change its approach so that then it will run it in a way that's flexible and adaptable. Um, now, some of this almost sounds like science fiction. You have to see it to believe it. And we'll look at it tomorrow. And we'll actually have a demo. Now, again, keep in mind, this is early days. This is the direction that we're going. This isn't anything even close to a finished product. By using this, agents can help us reflect using large language models. They use new tools, and that's kind of what I was referring to in my uh, uh, little uh, discussion we had here uh, earlier in the morning, was that one of the limitations that we have is that you know when we think of large language models, they can't really do much except kind of you know think inside their box, right? But that's not really the case. We can build tools for them to go out anywhere and find out anything. Right? All we need is the senses, so to speak, to be able to do that. And so they can go to the internet, they can go to these, they can go to I2B2, and, and, and I2B2 is kind of <laughs> a tool to them, you see? So these agents actually kind of work through the black box of the LM. I admit, I don't know how it, you know, all the things that happen in the, in the, in the large language model. It's um, pretty amazing considering how simplistic the actual algorithm is inside a large language model. But it then can go out and use tools like Wikipedia. Think of I2B2 as a tool. It can write new programs and run the code. Um, all of these things can actually be incorporated in this new vision of how we actually create the digital twin in I2B2. And that is how we'll kind of be able to carry ourselves into the next generation of I2B2 using uh, large language models and this agentic approach. And there's a few references that I wanted to put in, but I, because they're extremely important for the development of all of these, but that I didn't have an obvious place for. So, all right. Thank you. For questions, if anybody has some, I'm happy to bring the mic to you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. It's very impressive. So I guess I have to digest first. Uh, therefore, a question to first part, uh, to Griffin's part. I think it's a very practical tool if you ingest data that you get a structure semi-automatically. My question would be, how do you prevent this tool from inventing new structures that haven't been there before? So being a, uh, you know, very close to ontologies, I would like to, to see it mapped to some some fire profile or to some OMOP structures. And I, uh, how, are there some preventions that it invents a new structure which seemed to be in the, in the ingested data set or which doesn't fit to other data sets? The, uh, the, the algorithm we're using is something called Kessler and Comat. Um, you can provide it any type of data you want. You say, these are the features that I have in the data set. This is the target phenotype that I'm trying to generate. And through an unsupervised clustering, the regression will come up with a model for that. Um, you know, out of the box, what we have it set up for is leveraging an I2B2 data model with C codes rolling up I2B9 and 10 codes, leveraging RxNorm, LOINC, and then the models are a phenotype algorithm for each corresponding C code. So if you just install the software and run it, that's what it's going to do. It's going to create a thousand models for you that map to um, existing C codes, but then if you want to dive into the R scripts, you can go and set it to say, these, this is the feature that I want and build a model off of that. Now, what gets more complicated is if you're trying to come up with a model for something that doesn't have an existing code, we're providing it, here's a fee code, we just want you to create a better version of that. Um, if you're looking for something, Sean's example, in sort of long COVID 
brain fog or things like that where there isn't a good code for it, you do need to provide it with some gold standard data. And it may be that LLMs are able to generate that gold standard for you or patient reported outcomes, other components to that. Um, there's kind of a question of the accuracy of the models when this is unsupervised. So the Kessler comb up algorithms, we've run that at several institutions so far on dozens of different types of phenotypes. Probably about 70 or 80% of the time, the model that gets generated has a positive predictive value of 80% or higher, meaning they're very good models most of the time. The problem is you don't know which are the 70 or 80% of the models. So you do some chart review, kind of spot check it. But rather than having to do thousands of chart reviews to come up with the gold standard, train the model, we can train that we can train a thousand models in an unsupervised way and do some very small amounts of chart review to spot check to make sure, yes, this looks like it's working correctly or no, it somehow got things wrong and isn't performing as we are. Yeah, just uh, checking, this might be really useful for oncology, for example, where, you know, ICD is not good enough, ICD or not, so you need a combination with TNM or something else. So okay. this is something uh, the, the, the fee codes could express. I think this would be awesome if this would be semi-automatically and take, take this classification additionally to describe the situation you see. You bet, Or I mean, you can even see how this all kind of comes together, right? So we, the high performance method of doing this, think of that as, you know, it's it's testing the waters. It's doing the best it can. And then we do the automatic chart review and it kind of helps complement that for a small number because it's much lower performance than what uh, Griffin's described. And then it goes back and it alters it and so forth, right? That lets us get into this realm of rare diseases because it's a combination of many, what Griffin's describing is he can use any combination, right? Of uh, elements, features in the medical record, any labs that might be in there, pathology reports and so forth. So that, really kind of allows the creation of these computational phenotypes, which really can focus on exactly what the patient has in terms of a condition. And that's where we are defining what the digital twin becomes. Other questions? Hi, Sean. Um, one question regarding validation uh, of, for the model. Are you uh, using any tools or like partnering with Microsoft uh, regarding validating a model? Or, you know, when you say uh, we are going to read the chart and make sure that the result that you get from reading the chart and then comparing what the model output is. So uh, as far as reading the chart goes, automating that process so that the validation is, you know, because you have so much data to validate. Right, so uh, uh, a problem right now is that large language models are slow. Now you can paralyze them, but uh, that needs, but you just need that much times, you know, the hardware to run it. So um, you can paralyze, I, I don't know what Microsoft has in their um, computational centers. They must have millions, if not tens of millions of GPUs running. Um, when we're doing this task on, you know, one or two GPUs, I mean, it's kind of slowly kind of coming off. So you can do, you know, maybe 500 charts a day, <laughs> but that's about it in terms of, you know, all these reviews. Uh, so if we look at, you know, all these different things that looked at, right, um, there's like, you know, like 15 different things or so. And each one of them, you know, the red line represents what the large language model ultimately concluded after thinking about it for a while. So we can take a small, you know, a validation set from where Griffin did his work with, with uh, uh, Comap, and then we can use a, you know, automated chart review, <laughs> which has already gone through this process to make sure it's doing it correctly, right, to, you know, kind of put that together so that we can be reasonably assured of what home app is doing and correct it as needed. And you do see, we get into these kind of long workflows where we're kind of using things to kind of correct themselves and then go back and, and, and rethink things and correct themselves. And 
that is why you know we need some kind of orchestration layer to do all of this, which we're envisioning with with our agentic approach. Any other questions, Griffin or Sean? No, all right, how about another uh, round of applause?